Greetings again in Jesus' name. You know, I've found that almost everything in professed Christendom is written and taught and preached and supposed from a flawed premise of inbred moral corruption and human inability that's somehow remedied by the substitutionary payment or satisfaction, which is a magic cover for sin that's transferred to someone, received then by faith alone, not of works, unconditional pardon of past, present, and future sins with no strings attached. That's what I've seen across the board. The commonality of every professed Christian, preacher, theologian that you run into. See, the outcome of salvation to these people, eternal life, is determined by Christ's finished work. In your deeds, whether they're done in good or evil, have no consequence whatsoever, even though Jesus said they did. Again, the exact opposite of Scripture. And the rest of the stuff they teach is just icing on the cake. Positional, then, to your fixed relationship to Christ that's fixed upon your, your trust. There's no fear of judgment and no need for any additional effort. So all works of charity are complementary to your faith, but not at all meritorious. It's not, it's not necessary. See, the Christian then can always fall back on their sin nature, or their, their reason they were born in sin, for their constant failures. And they may be able to sin less, but never stop entirely, of course. And the only real difference between them and the, and the world out there that's living in their sins is they've received Jesus, and the world, the, the people haven't, they haven't received him yet. They haven't realized their identity in Christ yet. So sin, then, is always inevitable, and it's only then the sin of unbelief keep hearing this over and over again, the sin of unbelief that's going to separate you from God. Even though the Bible says if you do these things, it lists all different types of sins, of fornication and lust and perversion and drunkenness, you won't inherit the kingdom. No, they say only the sin of unbelief will keep him out of the kingdom. So then as a supposed Christian, you confess daily, and trust that Jesus is going to pick up your slack, and God understands you're not perfect, and so he's rescinded his judgment because he poured out his wrath on Christ, so raft is appeased and then pardon is free. Now with the exception of your ceremony and your traditions and some of the finer points of doctrine, that's all that they have to offer for people out there, the package deal in Christ. That's why your commonality among the Christians is no one's perfect is not of works and judge not. That's why you hear that from the lips of everyone, and they've got their, their verses to back it up. They've got Psalm 51, 5, and they've got Romans 5, 12, and those verses prove beyond any doubt that man's born in sin, regardless what the rest of the Scripture says, that man's, man's made up right, that David said he, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, and children are a heritage from the Lord. It doesn't matter. See, it doesn't matter against the balance of Scripture just what some theologians said uh, five or six hundred years ago, or maybe even longer than that. And if you reprove these people for their behavior, then they'll always and instantly number themselves among the wicked, as we've shown in the last couple of lessons. They claim and they have a desperately wicked heart, and all their righteousness is filthy rags. They sin daily in thought, word, and deed, and they're the wretched man of Romans 7, and the chief of sinners, and all the rest of it. All the rest of it. So anybody that, claim, that insists upon good behavior in one, one breath will always argue in favor of sin in the next. But then they're completely oblivious that they're doing this, even so-called holiness preachers. I've never been able to convince them that you're arguing in favor of sin. You're the one causing these people to have them return to their vomit constantly. But no, they, they just don't see it. So with the greater part then of professed Christian believing that they're born with this corrupted or depraved nature that severely hinders their ability to do what's right towards God, so virtue and integrity decline in our culture, and then a culture of immorality ensues. And that's what we have among the professed Christians, a complete culture of immorality. So if you believe you can't stop sinning and can't do what's right in God's sight, and it's all filthy rags and you're wicked, well, then you won't. It's, just that, it's really that simple. If you, don't, if you believe you can't, you won't. You're not going to make any effort. You know, everything else, you make the determined effort and the resolve to achieve great things and become the big sports hero or the great uh, academic person or the, uh, the professor, the doctor, the lawyer, the whatever, whatever of... People, whatever people would wish to achieve. But when it comes to Christendom, no, you don't do anything. You don't do anything because it's all done for you. 
So with the flawed understanding of Scripture, their conscience then is anesthetized by layers and layers of deception and reasoning that's derived from this mountains of theology that's heaped upon them, which is really nothing to do with Scriptures. So if you're satisfied with what you believe and you're certain that God is going to take you as is, you know, what more can be said to convince you otherwise, unless you're actually seeking? I can't change your will. The Holy Spirit can't change your will against your will. He can't make you willing if you're unwilling to yield to God and come clean with Him. It's because the package has you covered. It's like money in the bank. It's all been transferred to you by proxy. So if you cannot even begin to see how ridiculous it is to call yourself a Christian and a sinner at the same time, and how ridiculous it is to believe God's stupid enough to just wink at your hypocrisy and pretend you're not sinning when you do sin, well then, what else can be said? Not really much can be said against your arguments, because you have an answer for every argument, and it's always in favor of sin. But if you want to escape la-la land in the fairy tale world of the church that you've subjected yourself to, it's going to take a determined resolve to take up your cross and break free from all the filth and the lies of this world, this matrix that you're in, break your conditioning, stop listening to all these phony pundits, and do as he commands, and bear fruit worthy of repentance. Come clean with him, take up your cross. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me forever... Whoever uh, desires to save his life in, in this world is going to lose it. But if you lose your life in Christ, then you're going to find it. So strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many will try to enter, they won't be able to. Because narrow is the gate, and wide, narrow is the gate that leads to life. And few there be that find it. And wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many go by it. So what are the, what's your church preach? What's your pastors? They preach what? Few, not many. Strive. Instead of strive, it's trust. Instead of obey, it's receive. Instead of stop sinning, it's, well, I'm the Romans wretch. I can't stop sinning. And so the lesson in Romans 7, that everyone that is the refuge for just about every professed Christian out there, although let me say this before we preface before we get into this, is no one taught that Romans 7 was the Christian life, the carnal sold under sin, was a Christian until Augustine in Rome. And he used it as an excuse to cover his lust. And so did Ambrose and Jerome and many others in that period of history when it was uh, fast and loose Christianity, as it was called back then. They were the first ones to teach that, well, Romans 7 is talking about this dual nature that's in every man, this Gnostic teaching that came out of ancient Persia that, of course, is blended, blended deeply into Christianity now. So the fact of the matter is, no one taught it that way, not even the old holiness teachers. I could show you in the Nazarene manual, in the Wesleyan manual, that they do not consider Romans 7 to be the Christian life. But yet the preachers, the Nazarene preachers, the Wesleyan preachers, everyone that I've ever known in my lifetime in the 20th, 20th and 21st century, teach that you're the wretched man, desperately wicked heart. But yet their founders didn't, and they don't even know it. I've pointed it out to them. I've shown them in their manual, and they couldn't believe it. So that's how deeply ingrained this, this, this monster is in their heart. So really, it's easy to understand. If you look at Romans chapter 7, the premise of the argument is set right from the very start, where he says, I speak to those who know the law, who have a knowledge and an understanding, have reached the age of accountability, and determine whether they're going to obey it or not. Just like he says in verse 9, he says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So what's he mean, I was alive once without the law? Well, he means before the age of accountability, like children mentions in Deuteronomy 139, where the children has no knowledge of right and wrong. Well, before it, he had knowledge of right and wrong, to be able to transgress because sin is transgression of the law. Sin is not something in you. It's not some malady. It's not some, something in your DNA. Before he had that knowledge, he was alive once without the law. Just like the light that is born into every man that comes into the world in John 1, 9. See, that light is the light of conscience. That conscience develops over the passage of time, as we see so, depicted in Genesis chapter uh, 4 and 5. 
with the passage of time came Cain and Abel's dispute and then Abel, Abel doing well and being declared righteous in the scriptures and Cain, of course, murdering his brother even though he had the choice to rule over it because God told him you should rule over it. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not well, sin lies at the door. It's desire for you, but you should rule over it as we quote in many of, many of our lessons. But here again, that's what he's talking about. So he's speaking to somebody that's under the law that knows the law. So when he talks about, when he talks about in the, his other verses about being carnal, sold under sin, in verse 14, where they always begin the argument, where you got this dual nature dwelling in you. And of course, the NIV version and many of the other versions, they just throw sin nature in there in place of, uh, in place of evil desires. In the King James version, of course, in in uh, verse 8 uses the word concupiscence. So they'll say, but sin taking opportunity by the commandment producing all manner of evil desires, that's, or lusts in the Greek, they put concupiscence in there. In two other places in the King James Version in Thessalonians and Colossians. That concupiscence was again inserted by the people that invented this Roman 7 fallacy, the Augustine and Ambrose, Jerome, those people in the third century Rome, a Latin word invented to mean their passions and desires that dwelt in them, evidence of this sinful nature, this dark side of their nature, as, as uh, in contrast to the light side, or the contrast to their spirit. Remember, the Gnostics believed that everything material was evil and the spirit was pure. So they brought that, blended it in with this idea of concupiscence dwelling in man. So by the fact that he had natural inclinations 